Okay, we're, we're, we're live now. Um, people are starting to file in. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Suren Pillay uh, from the Center for Humanities Research, and uh, it is an honor to uh, and a delight to be hosting today's event, uh, which the Center for Humanities Research at UWC is co-hosting with the uh, Council for Social and Scientific Research in Africa, CODESRIA. Uh, and the topic of today's uh, seminar, as you all well know, is a discussion uh, with Professor Mahmoud Mamdani on his uh, on his new book, uh, Neither Settler Nor Native, The Unmaking of Permanent uh, Minorities, which was published in 2020. And the uh, format for today's seminar is that Professor Mamdani is going to uh, speak uh, to uh, the book itself for a few minutes after which we will open up to our uh, discussants, uh, who um, I will introduce shortly. Uh, I'm also uh, welcoming here uh, the Executive Secretary of Kodesria, uh, Godwin Murunga. Godwin will be moderating the conversation today. Uh, so after I introduce our speakers, uh, uh, Godwin uh, will be managing things on, 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 on this end. Uh, so thank you again all for coming. Uh, let me just then turn to introducing our, our speakers who are here today. I'm sure all of you uh, are familiar with the work of Professor Mahmoud Mamdani. He's currently, of course, the uh, Herbert Lieben Professor of Government at Columbia University and also the director of the Makarere Institute for Social Research in Africa, the author of a number of important texts, including Citizen and Subject, uh, uh, define a rule in 2012, uh, and of course a host of other books that many of you are familiar with. Uh, Professor Mamdani was also the president of Kodesria uh, between 1998 and 2002. We also have with us today uh, Professor Mshai Mangola, who is an auditorist, a performance scholar, uh, who uses the lens of culture in her work as an academic artist and an activist. She has a doctorate in performance studies from Northwestern University and a master's in creative arts from the University of Melbourne uh, and has also studied education at Kenyatta University. She is the chair of the board of Oreya Trust, the biggest non-state facilitator of civic education in Kenya and a member of the executive committee uh, of Codestia, as well as a founder member of the intellectual collectives, the Elephant and the Orature Collective. Uh, our, our next uh, presenter will be uh, Professor Adam Gedashu, who's a political theorist at the University of Chicago, whom we uh, hosted in another universal seminar not too long ago, where she spoke about her important text, World Making of the Empire, the Rise and Fall of Self-Determination. And our uh, uh, 
Our last respondent will be uh, Professor Raif Shrek, who is a jurist and a scholar of political philosophy and the philosophy of law and a lecturer on property law and theory of law. The Ono Academic College is also the academic co-director of the Minerva Humanities Center at Tel Aviv University and senior research fellow at the Ben Lear Jerusalem Institute. We were also scheduled to have with us uh, 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 former Minister of Arts and Culture in South Africa, uh, Paulo Jordan, uh, and hopefully uh, Minister Jordan might join us uh, as we go along and we can include him as a respondent. Uh, but as of now, uh, I welcome uh, Professor Mahmoud Ramdani to share with you, with us, uh, the key arguments of this important text. Over to you, Professor Mamdani. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Suren. Uh, thank you, Godwin. Um, thanks to all those who've made this event possible. Uh, I've been given uh, 20 minutes uh, for my remarks, and uh, I will use these to provide an overview of the book. So this is a book about the nation state and uh, post-colonial modernity. The nation state, according to the argument in the book, was born in Iberia in 1492. Its agenda was summed up by a single slogan, quote, one country, one people, one religion. This state project set fire to relations between majority and minorities within its boundaries, setting in motion processes of ethnic cleansing, specifically of Muslims and Jews. This was followed by a century of religious wars in Europe. This was the first, the non-liberal phase in the making of the nation state. The 1648 Treaty of Westphalia was said to be the antidote to religious wars. Two key components of the modern state were born at Westphalia, religious toleration at home and the reciprocal guarantee of sovereignty abroad. The liberal justification was put forward in John Locke's treatise on tolerance. Catholics can be tolerated if they renounce political support of the Pope or of any power outside England. The liberal notion of the nation state turned majority and minority into permanent political identities. Only the majority has sovereignty. The minority must not participate in sovereignty. The notion of a sovereign majority alongside non-sovereign minorities was the original sin in liberal thought on the nation state. In this book, I explore the export of the notion of different kinds of citizens, sovereign and non-sovereign, from the US to South Africa and Nazi Germany, and finally to Israel. At the same time, the book explores the construction of an epistemological project that grounded the political distinction between sovereign and non-sovereign subjects in an epistemic and legal distinction. What began as a political distinction between religious groups was extended to a civilizational difference between races and tribes. This development is explored in some detail in the chapter on Sudan. This is also a book about the United States as a founding experience in modern colonialism and about the reservation as the site where core institutions of modern colonialism were forged. In addition, this is a book about extreme violence as a consequence of modern nation state building in the post colonies. I contrast two ways of thinking of extreme violence. The first is the criminal model popularized by Nuremberg. The second is the political model born of the transition from apartheid in South Africa. What can be learned from the failure of denazification in Germany and the relative success of the post apartheid transition in South Africa. Finally, the book asks, what is transportable in the South African experience? What does South Africa have to teach us? To answer this question, the last chapter takes a fresh look through a South African lens at, is at Israel-Palestine, the most intractable political problem in the contemporary world. In the time at my disposal, I would like to comment on four issues. The first is an issue of great significance in the US today, and I think globally. 
how do we distinguish colonialism from racial domination? Second, what is the difference between an immigrant and a settler? This is an issue relevant to all settler colonies, in particular the US, South Africa, and Israel. Third, what does it mean to think of identity as historical and political, born of a particular form of the state, as opposed to something natural and permanent? And finally, I point to the need of an alternative to the nation state so as to decouple the nation and the state. Let me begin with some thoughts on what is different about the situation of American Indians and African Americans. Should we name the pre-Columbian communities of the Americas as Indian or as native? What difference would it make if we renamed the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC as the National Museum of the Native American? Why is it that the 1964 Civil Rights Act did not apply to Indian, Indians in reservations, but did to African Americans and other minorities? So that a separate Indian Civil Rights Act had to be passed in 1968. The two acts are not the same. The 1964 Act is constitutionally binding, whereas the 1968 Indian Act is only advisory. Reservation Indians are not and have never been rights-bearing citizens of the United States in a constitutional sense. The reservation was a creation of the United States. The reservation is a separate polity, separate from the US. The Europeans who came to America were not immigrants, they were settlers. Whether they sought equality or advantage, immigrants came to join existing policies, polities. Settlers come to displace existing polities and establish their own exclusive sovereignty. Indian reservations are not part of the sovereign state we call the US. In the words of Chief Justice John Marshall, writing in mid 19th century, reservations are, quote, domestic dependent colonies. Politically, the term Indian tribal sovereignty masks colonial domination. Reservation Indians are legally wards of Congress. Reservation authorities are overseen by a vast federal bureaucracy known as the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It is no different from the colonial bureaucracy that governed any indirect rule colony in Africa. The Indian reservation was part of a two state solution, a sovereign state alongside a non-sovereign protectorate. The two state solution was Lincoln's contribution in the second half of the 19th century. Lincoln claimed to provide a permanent solution for Indians who had survived the genocide. America also originated the notion of differentiated citizenship with only some participating in sovereignty. Until 1921, Indians were nationals, but not citizens. After that, Indians had to be naturalized as citizens, meaning they had first to be purged as members of Indian polities before they could become US citizens. Africans were enslaved individually and then governed in thousands of plantations. Indians were colonized as a people. Colonized Indians and African slaves represent two different strategies of domination with radically different consequences. Reservation Indians and African Americans do not have the same relationship to the US. Racial and colonial domination are not the same, even if racial discrimination is common to both. Economically, the American Indian symbolized stolen land. The African slave embodied stolen labor. Politically, Indians were governed in a protectorate as part of a two-state solution. African slaves were racially segregated within a one-state polity and governed in separate plantations. Invented in America, the two-state solution was exported to Germany. Whereas Hitler wanted to extinguish all minorities in Germany, post-Holocaust Germany looked for a two-state solution. Instead of reintegrating Jews into Germany, it supported a state exclusively for Jews. The Israelis pushed their own two-state solution, starting with the Nakba. 
the Nakba continues today. It is worth noting that South Africa is the place where apartheid tried to press home, to press home a two-state solution, but failed. The one-state solution has provided a more suitable political frame for the development of the struggle against Jim Crow and racial domination. A multi-state solution, as in the Indian case, fragmented and isolated, isolated the colonized in reservations, which South Africans called Bantustans. Even if it proceeded by fits and starts, sometimes even receded, the one-state framework has made possible the development of alliances. The two-state solution explains the continued isolation and colonial subjugation of the reservation Indians. South African settlers attained state independence in 1910. Over the next few years, settlers studied how Indians were governed in North America. Three key elements of the American model were imported to South Africa, homeland, traditional authority, and customary law. First, every tribe must be territorially contained in a homeland. Second, every homeland must be administered by a homeland authority sanctioned as chance historical and traditional, and thus not subject to being elected. Finally, this traditional authority must enforce a customary law on the homeland, also trans historical and thus unchanging, with one proviso, that custom be excised of all practices or notions that settlers considered repugnant to civilization. South Africa was not the only one to learn from the US, so did Germany and Hitler. Hitler learned that genocide is doable and therefore thinkable, and that it is possible to legislate a hierarchy of citizens, some first class, others second class, and yet others third class, as with Puerto Ricans, African Americans, and Indian citizens after 1921. Hitler appointed a committee of lawyers to study American citizenship laws as preparation to draft Nuremberg laws for Jews. This learning process has been documented in full by James Q. Whitman of Yale in Hitler's American model. Denazification failed because Nuremberg shut its eyes to the political project that inspired and propelled Nazism. That project was the nation state. Nazism went beyond distinguishing a sovereign majority from non-sovereign minorities. It strove for a purified nation state, one that would cleanse the nation of all minorities, the non-liberal version of the nation state. There was an American debate on Nazism after the Second World War. Was Germany liberated or occupied? Was Nazism a state project or a social project? Who should be held responsible for Nazism, the nation or the state, Nazi leaders or the German people? The American consensus was that responsibility for Nazism lay with the German people. At Nuremberg and after, millions were considered criminally culpable, yet Nazism was never probed as a political project. A similar debate unfolded inside Germany, particularly among German left intellectuals the most prominent being Franz Neumann and Herbert Marcuse. Their answer, Nazism was a nation state project, a project of both the Nazi state and the fault nation to eradicate the state territory of national minorities like Jews and Roma, etc. Nazism was above all a political project. Their conclusion was that to succeed, denazification would have to be a joint project of allies and anti-fascist Germans, but Americans were unwilling to do that. The Soviets were willing, though only temporarily, and not after the Berlin Uprising. I turn to Israel. Are Jewish people in Israel settlers or immigrants? The Jewish population of Mandate Palestine belonged to three groups, natives, immigrants, and settlers. The last being the group that wanted to establish an exclusive Jewish state. Palestinians inside Israel cannot participate in sovereignty. They have rights, even political rights, including the right to vote, but they cannot participate in power. 
Israel is a Jewish state. There is in Israel, Palestine, an ongoing debate on the merits of a one state versus a two state solution. It calls on us to think through the difference between colonial and racial subjugation, even where racism plagues both. In American terms, it is the alternative represented by the African slave and the colonized Indian. For a third alternative, we have to look at the South African transition from apartheid. I trace the turning point in anti-apartheid politics in South Africa to the 1970s. Anti-apartheid politics before 1970s reproduced the racialized architecture of apartheid. Each racial group organized separately as defined by organized by apartheid power. Africans as ANC, Indians as Natal Indian Congress, Coloreds as Colored People's Congress, and whites as Congress of Democrats. By reproducing the architecture of apartheid inside the resistance, resistance gave apartheid a natural flavor. The apartheid mindset was broken only in the 1970s. The key initiative came from the student movement, starting when black students led by Biko left the liberal white student organization, formed their own separate body and went on to organize township dwellers, starting with Soweto. Left in the wilderness, radical white students turned to organizing hostile workers on the fringes of townships. Out of this experience was born an epistemological awakening that white and black are political identities and that political identity is historical, not natural. Black said Biko is not a color. If you're oppressed, you're black. This was also the turning point in the Africana journey from being junior partners of British colonialism to becoming a part of the anti-apartheid coalition. Born in the 70s and 80s, the South African moment signified three epistemological shifts. From mobilizing opposition to apartheid, it went on to champion an alternative to apartheid. From calling for a state of the majority, the national majority, the black majority, it went on to champion a state for all, initially not just all citizens, but all residents. From an opposition to whites, it went on to oppose white power. It depoliticized race and historicized the notion of majority and minority. 1994 led to the birth of a new political community. This outcome should be seen as an alternative to Nuremberg, which opened the gate to two purified states, a Germany without Jews and an Israel without Palestinian. The anti-apartheid struggle was not directed from a single center, but from multiple centers. Sometimes it included contradictory initiatives. Take the example of the anti-apartheid boycott, which was directed from outside the country and the internal political struggle, which demanded reform of the political process to allow them to allow the oppressed to exercise the right to participate in the political process. Whereas the anti-apartheid boycott made no distinction between South African state and society, calling for a boycott of both, the internal political struggle proceeded by building alliances with all sectors of white society so long as they did not openly and actively support the apartheid state. Apartheid power was not defeated. Neither did apartheid win. The situation in the mid 1980s could only be described as a stalemate. Why then did apartheid power agree to negotiate in 1990s? My own sense is that two considerations made captains of apartheid rethink their primary reliance on a military strategy. One, the possibility that anti-apartheid mobilization may spread from the townships to Bantustans. But more important, I think, was the second possibility. One that signaled the likelihood of an even more scary outcome. Boers realized that the hitherto pro-apartheid Boer intelligentsia was gradually beginning to abandon apartheid as a state project. I want to reflect on the less lessons for Palestinians. The Palestinian population is today fragmented into three, colonized citizens of Israel, residents of the occupied territories 
and refugees. Since 1948, each has been the source of a different political initiative. Refugees were the social base of the armed struggle. The first Intifada moved the social base of Palestinian resistance from refugees to Israel-Palestine. The second Intifada propelled Balad into calling for an inclusion of Palestinians in the political process, calling for a state of all citizens. After that came BDS. Anchored in the occupied territories, BDS calls for an external boycott, asking the world to divest from Israel. The South African lesson is that we need to think the liberation project as political, not just moral. In Palestine, this means building on the gains of Balad and adopting a political strategy that will welcome anti-Zionist and non-Zionist Jews into the larger political movement for a decolonization of the Israeli state, de-Zionization of the Israeli state. Rather than think of Balad and BDS as representing strategic alternatives, the South African lesson is to embrace both as standing for complementary strategies, external and internal. The lesson of the African-American struggle, too, is to build alliances within a single state so as to forestall the fragmentation, isolation, and continued colonization as has happened to Indians in North America. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud, for that succinct summary uh, of uh, what is otherwise uh, um, slightly less than 400 page book. Um, we plan to have interventions from, uh, at the moment, three colleagues. Uh, we're hoping that uh, the fourth one will show up on our radar at some point. Uh, please, uh, the colleagues uh, handling um, uh, uh, technical part of it, if it shows up, prompt me because I'm unable to figure that out. Uh, but in no particular order, just going by what I can see on my screen, can I uh, ask uh, that we start with uh, Adam on the on the one side uh, with your interventions, 10 minutes, please, and then follow up with the uh, Mshaye and finally with Raif. Uh, and I'm not going to interrupt uh, in between your interventions. So once you finish, uh, Adam, please uh, signal Mshaye and she will pick up and then we proceed like that. Okay, great. Um, it's a pleasure to join you all in discussing Mahmoud Membani's Neither Settler Nor Native, a provocative and timely exploration of the colonial origins of the nation state and its continuing consequences for our post-colonial present. There's much to say about the insights of the book, but in my brief comments, I would like to point to some of the ways the book develops and expands on Mamdani's earlier work, and then offer three questions for discussion. In his 2001 book on Rwanda, When Victims Become Killers, Mamdani asks, what can the study of Africa teach us about late modern life? Neither settler nor native offers two answers to this question. First, the analysis of the colonial and post-colonial uh, African state developed in works ranging from citizen and subject to define and rule are transformed in, the, in, in this work into lenses that reveal the workings of political modernity more generally. That is the politicization of racial and ethnic identity so central to the experience of colonial state craft in Africa is now conceived as part and parcel of the formation of the modern nation state as such which everywhere involved the violent production of permanent majorities and minor minorities. This analytic move suggests one way to arrive at the other universals, the rubric under which we are convening today. Such a critical standpoint, as Mamdani put it in Citizen and Subject, refuses the choice of abstract universalism and intimate particularism. Instead, he identifies recurring logics of state formation under conditions of colonial modernity, while also remaining alert to their divergent instantiations and historical trajectories. In this way, Africa is positioned as a site of generating analytical universals that speak to the global conditions of modernity more broadly. Second, given the attention to the divergences of this model, Africa and the case of South African, the South African anti-apartheid struggle in particular 
offers alternative normative models to the impasses of political modernity. As we have heard, the crucial turning point in South Africa arrived in the 1970s when students and worker-led mobilization abandoned race-based resistance to forge cross-racial alliances that would become the basis of a deracialized vision of political membership. The transition period also produced a framework of political justice distinct from the criminal model of Nuremberg. Despite the global celebration of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which has since become a model and framework for transitional justice around the world, Mamdani centers the Convention for a Democratic South Africa. Kadesa, he argues, sought not punishment, but reform. It was not victor's justice, but a negotiated settlement that created a new political system in which apartheid's enemies and supporters were included as citizens. Mamdani's efforts to draw out alternatives and possibilities from the history of political struggles speaks to a commitment to a historically grounded political theory. As he notes in the introduction, historic narrative and normative ideals are entangled moments in the book. The normative is excavated and reconstructed from history. That is, normative horizons are imminent to uh, Mamdani's analytical framework. They do not operate as terms of an ideal theory that stand apart from political practices. Instead, they are disclosed in and through the history of uh, state formation and the models of, or the modes of political contestation generated within and against these frameworks. The upshot of this mode of theorizing is that it not only locates alternative trajectories within each historical context, but also points to the contingent political processes of coalition building and the distribution of power within a political field that are central to realizing any political vision. This connection between the narrative and the normative uh, leads to my first question, which has to do with the epistemological revolution that Mamdani argues is a necessary component to political decolonization. Political decolonization, he writes, is a two-sided process. Externally, the assertion of independence from uh, foreign control, and internally, the reimagination and redefinition of a political community. On Mamdani's account, epist uh, the epistemological revolution is closely tied to this internal political revolution, not throwing off outside rule, but excising the ideology of political modernity internalized under co colonialism. I was struck by this pairing of epistemological and political decolonization because critiques of epistemic injustice, epistemic colonization, as well as demands uh, to decolonize forms and institutions of knowledge are now reoccurring features of our contemporary political landscape. I want to ask how you situate this, uh, this call for epistemic revolution in this contemporary context. Its explicit linkage to the reconstruction of political community seems to be a significant difference, and one that perhaps ties this vision to earlier modes of um, moments of anti-colonial thought, like Fanon or Gandhi, who similarly viewed epistemic decolonization as a necessary part of their political projects. Where does the contemporary struggle to overcome the ideological and epistemological legacies of colonialism overlap with or depart from uh, these earlier moments of decolonization? And what lessons, if any, might we learn from the early efforts at epistemic decolonization? I wanna turn now to a second question about the critique of the state. A central intervention of the book is to locate the birth of the modern nation state in 1492, rather than the standard narrative in which six, the 1648 uh, piece of Westphalia is the originary moment of the modern state system. The implications of this reorient reorientation are significant. Where 1492 points us to the birth of the state in conquest, expulsion, and genocide, 1648 points to a rosy dawn of toleration and state self-limitation. Where 1492 makes the extra-European world central to the story of the rise of the nation state, 1648 is primarily an intra-European affair. Yet even, even as we take this long imperial history of the nation state uh, um, up, how do we think through the important transformations of the nation state, particularly the rise and universalization of popular sovereignty and democracy in the 19th and especially 20th centuries? Far from separate forms, the democratic state and the nation state have been entangled, mutually entangled in this period. 
the numerical principle central to the democratic Im imaginary has contributed to enshrining majoritarianism as the only morally and politi le politically legitimate form of rule. Mamdani distinguishes between permanent majorities and political majorities, which are shifting democratic co coalitions. From a democratic point of view, Mamdani writes, majorities and minorities cannot precede the democratic process, rather they must uh, be its outcome. Yet in practice, democratic majorities and prescriptive permanent majorities have been difficult to disentangle. So my question is, are there structures internal to, the democra to democratic practices, electoral competition, partisan mobilization uh, that have entrenched the politicization of identity? And if democratic practices have contributed to the calcification of more permanent majorities and minorities, what practices might be counterposed to these dynamics? Finally, I'd like to turn to the call to decouple the nation from the state. This relationship between state and nation, Mamdani argues, produces a vicious cycle whereby the nation imagines that the state, the state as its protector and aggrandizer, the state fulfills the role, and the nation's investments in the state's bestowal of privilege only in, intensifies. In, ad, in addition to decoupling nation from state, I wonder if this account also points to the need to diminish and fragment the power of the state, such that it does not have a monopoly over the role of protector and aggrandizer. Capture of state institutions becomes so central to political communities because it appears as the only way to protect rights and privileges. If these powers and capacities were not centralized in the state, would it help to limit the competition and control conflict over control of the state? Would a decentralized and confederal structure work to, to, to also undo the pathologies of the nation state? To be sure, federal structures that maintain the politicization of tribal and ethnic identity would not move us far in this direction. The fragmentation of South Sudan, as well as the current crisis in nearby Ethiopia, illustrate the delusion of power sharing or federalism as a simple solution to the problem of politicized identity. For in each of these cases, the coupling of nation and state is only replicated and reproduced internally by tribe and ethnicity. But might there be forms of fragmenting state power such that political power is distributed in overlapping and plural institutions that help to disperse and mitigate escalating conflicts tied to state capture. If the nation is decoupled from the state, might the state with its claims of omnipotence, its vision of unitary sovereignty also have to be radically reimagined? So I'll stop there and turn it over. Thank you very much. And again, I also do want to just um, Thank very much both um, Codestria and the center for inviting me to speak to what has been the most amazing and provocative um, read. And thank you very much, Professor Mamdani. I wanted to start with um, citing a, a phrase, a statement by Chinua Achebe that kept coming to me as I read this book. It is the storyteller who tells us who, what we are, who creates history. The storyteller creates the memory that survivors must have Otherwise, their surviving would have no meaning. This is a statement that was very, that is familiar to me, but kept on resonating in a different way as I read through this book, as I read through chapter after chapter. And there's a lot to say about this book, but in the 10 minutes I have, I'm going to focus with two things that I think you challenge us to. Um, first, an epistemological project, and second, a cultural project. And if I have time in the 10 minutes, I'll mention the political project, but I suspected many people would talk to the political project. So I'll only come to that very much at the end. I am going to generally steer away from the temptation to delve into the specificities of the case studies, because for me, what they did was to just open up my mind to thinking about how does this theory work? And um, let me just mention that I read it um, hand in hand with two books, Ivono War's Dust, which speaks to Kenya, especially Kenya after post-election violence, and Novuyo Shuma's House of Stone, because it really struck me that in this project, you, are, you, you want us to start from thinking about extreme violence and how extreme violence becomes a productive place to reimagine new societies. So the epistemological um, project, as a performance scholar, I'm very much invested in how we make meaning. 
as human beings and how that meaning therefore has impact in our lives. Uh, Margaret Drewell speaks about performance as a means by which people reflect on their current condition, define and or reinvent themselves and their social world, and therefore reinforce, resist or subvert perverting social orders. If I read this book right, you are inviting us to think about the nation state as we know it, and the diversity of ways in which we reinforce, resist, and subvert that imaginary in our politics, and how that in turn affects our potential to sustain peace in our society. Something else that came to mind as I was thinking was this dream that is expressed, this desire in the UN SDG um, 16, of, for humanity to live in peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, which can provide access to justice for all and build effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. And the basic argument of this book is that this nation state that we have embraced will not deliver on that dream. And you therefore propose a delinking of the nation from the state as the only feasible way to achieve this dream. You invite us to think about the limitations of the intellectual building blocks that have been primarily provided for the foundation of this project. And first of all, I, I found it productive to think about the spheres of knowledge that we draw from. Just the way you put together the book, you made clear the limitations of privileging particular spaces, such as the academy, and the ways in which we work in, um, in disciplines as, as bounded spaces. I really appreciated your reminder that intellectuals come in different forms and work in different spaces, something that isn't new, and indeed imperialism recognized. So the silencing of bards, the banning of dances and music and stories and the legal provisions such as the Witchcraft Act, which we had in Kenya and some other colonial um, settler colonies, wasn't just about civilizing, and you draw attention to that word, the primitive, but also about erasure of the polity that existed before. And therefore, that the, the act of deconstructing colonialism must pay attention to this also as we come to constructing whatever new polity that we think will work, we must pay attention to this. Beyond the official histories emanating from westernized academy, you draw attention to the important role played by other kinds of intellectuals, historians, storytellers, and memory keepers who do their work in other realms, working in different spheres and within traditions that have been erased or marginalized from the mainstream of policy, politics, and intellectual engagement of important issues. It's easy for us when we read this book to, to just go beyond that and start to get into the meat and the content. But I think it's really important that we cannot do the work that you propose without paying attention to this. But we must also pay attention in the academy to which disciplines count, and you demonstrate why transcending disciplinary boundaries is so important. For example, for a political scientist, you engage really seriously with history and show the importance of juxtaposing official histories with non-official histories, people's memories. The question that arises then is, how do we validate all the different kinds of memories that we have to work with? And how do we deal with the contradictions, with the complementarities? What space do we accord them? These are things that we will need to think through as we look into working with policy um, and, and working with all kinds of state projects. You also call us to think about text, how knowledge is stored, what knowledge is stored, what is privileged, what is the place of different kinds of documentation. For example, in state processes, as you examine legal processes, you look at what constitutes evidence and who gets to be in the room providing what kind of intellectual um, evidence for what, for example, as you talk about South Sudan. So three concepts that I want to draw attention for me is the power of story, what stories shape our lives, by who, from whom, why, and to what effect. I think that was a really compelling thread. And going back to the stories, as you said, what, um, what happens when we tell ourselves the wrong stories over and over and over again, so compellingly that we come to believe in them and act according to them, whose stories are privileged, manipulated, or nuanced? And how do we move from the dominance and hegemony of the single story to multifaceted conversations? Secondly, the power of language. Um, terms like settler, native, survivor, civilization, nation, state, 
the names we have, how we name ourselves, whose names we embrace, which ones we ignore, which ones we set aside, which ones give us discomfort. I kept even thinking as I prepared for this about the language we use in discussing the important issues we raise and how we translate out of the familiar technical terms that do important work in spaces like the academy to words that work in the public spaces of everyday conversations to move forward the project that you propose. Thirdly, the question of the imagination. How do we think or imagine our way forward? So much of our thinking has been held captive to the past. How can we acknowledge that past, but make a choice in the present not to be held imprisoned by it, but to use it to pull us for, you know, to be pulled forward into the future? What are the tools that we need? What tools facilitate it, such as the arts, and what tools um, hold us imprisoned into the past? I think the book calls us to think about um, how these can become a prism for enabling us to enter into the firm, into, into the future. And indeed, the, as I was reading it, I felt like the sunk of a bird whose head is in the past, but who is working in the present as it flies into the future was very much hovering over my head. If I may speak briefly to the cultural project, I, I, was, I just started to think about how the African Union has designated 2021 as the year of arts, heritage, and culture. And these three are very much at the center of your project. I don't have the time to go into some of the very productive ways that the project speaks to these three imperatives. But I thought about the implications of the cultural policies we put in place beyond the important questions of the economic imperatives of the arts or the need to preserve our culture. More, most of all, I spent time thinking about this line. History warns us that culture is not nationhood. Nationhood is the instrumentalization of culture for the purposes of domination. We can have culture without nations. We can have states without nations, but we can only have the democracy within the without the nation state. My questions, therefore, in my mind is thinking about how we take the idea of a national culture as articulated by Franz Fanon Cabral, which has become very embedded in our understanding of how to move forward as nation states. In Kenya, we have an article of the constitution that tells us that culture is the foundation of the nation. Um, and thinking through how we construct the, the nation, Stuart Hall gives us five ways that center on the accepted narrative of the nation, the essentials of a national culture, the symbols of a national culture, the symbols of a nation, the foundational myth of the nation, the idea of a people who are the nation. And as I read through your work, I kept crossing each one of them. So I would be very interested in the questions and the conversations we have to have around this challenge on thinking how we deal with this beloved idea of a national culture in relation to the state. And for finally with the political project, I think you talk a little bit, you talk quite a lot about state. And I began to think about what do we mean by the state and the state delinked from the nation? This mode of governance, to quote you, introduced by colonialism that has become so effectively naturalized that even resistors replicate it. Therefore, what does it mean to reimagine the political? How do we get the political will to do so, so that we move beyond this focus on good leaders or good institutions to imagining and putting into place a new political um, framework? To start with the conundrum of extreme violence as the political project of an aggrieved, dissatisfied constituency, rather than purely the criminal in, uh, violation of the rule of law by an individual, means that we have to engage with the idea of peace, not merely as a restoration of the rule of law, but as the revolutionary transformation of society through political reform premised on a new political order through new political identities. This takes me back to the question of sustaining peace and the dream of SDG 16 that I started with. Let me finish with that second phrase associated with Achebe that kept running through my mind as I read through your book, no condition is permanent. Thank you, Professor Mamdani for giving us a productive place to think through this phase in relation to the nation, the state and the challenge of sustaining peace. unmute myself.
I'm unmuted now, okay. So I'm really thrilled to be uh, on this panel, on this book and um, with this group of uh, speakers, researchers, activists and thinkers. Um, this is a really thrilling book. It touches on many things that uh, um, worry me as a political activist and that I have an uh, intellectual interest uh, as a researcher as well. So this book, it really brings uh, to my attention lots of things that uh, I'm engaged with uh, in my practical, political, everyday life, but as well as intellectual life. Now the book brings so, so many issues um, to the surface. It would be a mistake to read the introduction and the conclusion without reading the test cases because the test cases sometimes bring so lots of insights that sometimes it's difficult to group them in the overall thesis of the book. So the details are very important in this book. So anyone who's planning to read the book, uh, don't skim it, read the test, uh, test cases because there's something in the details which is important. Now, uh, I have to limit my remarks to uh, really to very, very limited uh, um, set of questions because otherwise uh, we will not finish. So instead of making comments, I would make the comments in the form of questions actually uh, to continue the conversation or to give some ideas for uh, uh, Professor Mamdani for his next book. So my first question is actually, uh, is a certain thesis that the book start with, but then it's suddenly somehow disappears or dissipates. This is the question of dyads, dyads that the two concepts are tied together in a way. Uh, so for example, um, we, we, you think of uh, scientific revolution and you think of Hiroshima, you think of uh, capitalism and you think, let's say, poverty, homelessness. Uh, you think of probably uh, colonialism and you might think of ethnic cleansing. So there are many concepts that appeared historically together and one might think of them as dyads that one is constitutive of the other. This is the word I think you use, constitutive of the other, speaking about colonialism and nationalism. Now, uh, toward the conclusion, this theme of uh, mutual constitution, it's not clear where do you want to go from here? Because one of the uh, uh, things that the modernist paradigm kept on insisting is that when you have such dyads, they are associated historically, but could be separated analytically. In the sense, you might have good scientific revolution without pollution. So you take one part of the diet and suppress it or eliminate it. Or you can have colonialism without nationalism or nationalism without colonialism or nationalism without ethnic cleansing. So part of the rebound or um, part of the debates in uh, colonial and post-colonial studies is to argue that actually this decoupling is impossible. That these things go together. And if you want to search an alternative actually it's not that you should take one overcoming the other, you should change the whole paradigm. But this is a question that one should think, speaking especially in the centers who thinks of other universals, where is the other is, is, coming, is coming from? And what does it mean that in 1492 colonialism and nationalism were born together? Does that mean if they die, they should die together? So 
this is an overarching question about this idea of dyads, whether it's been to take Hegel in the philosophy of history, he speaks that we can speak about the conditions necessary for the birth of the phenomena, and then the condition for the reproduction of the phenomena. So I have a cell phone, uh, without reproducing the, uh, the, uh, the project. So do we have, so capitalism and Protestantism were conditions, let's say, for capitalism or for democracy. Do we have all to become Protestant in order to have democracy? So th 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 this is one, one set of questions. The other, and I think this is a topic that many have, um, I'm sure, around your tours and also today, this idea of the decoupling of the state from the nation. I think this needs um, further elaboration. Uh, first of all, what is meant by the nation when you speak about the decoupling of the state from the nation? Because if one think of the nation as a product of the state, then the idea of the nation without the state is just logical mistake because we can't think the idea of the nation without thinking the state because it is the states that produces the nation. And in your imagination, the nation stands as an opposite sort of to the citizenship, which is a sort of contractual set of rights category and the nation is something given, it's primordial. But the nation could be thought actually as the continuation, the logical continuation of the name of citizenship. So if citizenship is a category, it's a legal category, the nation could be the social category that actually reproduced by the state. And that's why when you look in passports, they ask you about your nationality. Nationality doesn't refer to anything primordial or cultural or something you are born into. It's something that you acquire as a legal status. So nationality is actually, it's a slippery category that can flirt with citizenship and can flirt with primordial. So that you have nation, nationality, nationalism. So it's a tricky, the, the area, it's not clearly. Now, if, if you meant to say that to decouple the nation from the state, meaning the nation in the primordial cultural sense of organic sense of the nation, which is, I think th this is uh, what you're uh, proposing. Then let's say something like that. First of all, um, this is, has been probably the liberal dream for the last 200 years. The liberal dream in liberal philosophy, not uh, uh, specific liberals, not as a historical movement, but liberalism is based on, let's say uh, three negations. Don't look to the past, look to the future in a way. You're not where you came from, where you're going to. Think of individualism, not of collectivity, and think of sameness, not difference. Sameness in the category of the citizen, the persona that post, put mask on his face, and we are all have a same bundle of, of rights. And this idea of this liberal idea of the citizen that is abstracted from pre, primordial uh, gives us a certain conception of, of state and society, which is basically contractual. This is gives gave birth to the social contract theory. But social contract theory and this image of the individual liberal self has been under attack for 200 years. What are the conditions of this individualism? From Hegel to Herder to German romanticism, uh, and even to British uh, skepticism like David Hume uh, that question this uh, entity called the self that is basically contractual. There's something in this uh, falling back into belongings that we don't construct actually, 
that is very relieving for many people. That gives them many meaning, actually. This irrational being with others. Uh, as a self, we are not only rational, we are expressive selves. We need language. We need community in order to orient ourselves culturally uh, and even uh, morally. So what I want to stress is this history of a critique of this liberal self and that this liberal self, sorry, it, it didn't work. People fall back on their uh, identities. I, I have, I know I have probably to finish, I've, I've been talking for the last uh, uh, 10, uh, nine minutes. So, and to continue this thread, I, I want you to expand on this idea of the, that those identities are constructed. They are not natural, they are not uh, permanent. Okay, they're not neither permanent, neither natural, uh, but many constructed ideals, uh, many constructed concepts are extremely important for people holding them. I'm a Palestinian. This is completely constructed. Before 100 years, the British and the French said that this is Palestine. It became a geopolitical category and it, it gives meaning to my struggle as a Palestinian, not only as an Arab. So I want to push you on, on, this, uh, on this distance you take from nationalism, which if I were now debating a nationalist, I would take your position, either the Marxist or the liberal to, to critique identity politics. But for example, to, to continue this line and with this, I will finish. Let's think about uh, the denazification. It's clearly Nazism is the extreme end of identity politics in the worst sense possible. It's the extreme sense of racism with political violence, with annihilation. Now, your argument is kind of saying, look, if we want to decolonize, it's not enough to cut Nazism from our political imaginary or, or repertoire. We should start early on on the slippery slope. The minute you go up into this slippery slope of nationalism that thinks politically or politicize nations and groups, then you shouldn't be surprised you get to Nazism. Nazism is probably only one natural conclusion, if not inevitable, natural conclusion of this uh, politicizing of identities. But the issue is, and that's the strengths and also the weakness of, of, uh, of, of slippery slope argument. But can't we stop in the middle? Can't we think of a kind of uh, nationalism, which is still healthy, which is still not violent, which is still not immersed in ethnic cleansing, but just celebrates culture, history, um, and give some meaning to people's life because people need identity. They need identity, they need culture, and they need history. Probably some of us need it less, but some of us need it more. And the question, if there is no middle ground, that one can think of nationalism as also as a liberating, not only as something that steal from us uh, and make us sort of uh, lead us to political violence. I have endless uh, uh, other comments to say, but I would stop here and thank you again for this invitation and thank you, uh, Mahmoud, for this really very rich book. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much uh, uh, to all the panelists. Uh, I think, uh, Mahmoud, you have a, a first set uh, of interesting questions that I think you can respond to. I have seen a few other questions uh, in the Q&A and in the regular chat. Uh, some of them actually have already been raised by colleagues who responded to you, uh, epistemological questions, but also I think there is a big issue about how you think through the decoupling of the state from the nation and what that means. Uh, potentially, I've seen quite a number of questions being highlighted in the Q&A. So Mahmoud, I give you a few minutes to respond to those you can, and then uh, uh, I'll go to the Q&A with the rest of the panelists. Thank you. 
Um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, it's a it's a shower of questions. It's a forest of questions. It's a thicket of questions. I don't know, lots of questions, which is wonderful for me. Um, and uh, and I assume that uh, uh, nobody really expects me to engage with all of these, but I will engage with a few, just to get a sense of, to give a sense of what I'm talking about. And I'm going to begin at the end, uh, begin with Raif. Uh, everybody should know uh, that Raif is partly responsible for this book. Uh, amongst the individuals who I engaged with more or less through the entire process of writing the book, uh, Raif was one of them. I think Raif read practically every version, practically every draft and, 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 and generously commented on it. And sometimes Raif tried probably his best to get me to, to, to think otherwise. And, uh, and, and I, was, uh, I was equally stubborn. And finally Raif said to me, well, Mahmoud, I think you will, you will have to write another book. Uh, this book will not be enough. Um, so let me, let me get to some of the issues that Raif raises. But to Raif, I am uh, hugely thankful. Uh, for, for all his contribution to, to my thought process and my development as I tried to read this, write this book. Well, liberalism. Um, liberalism forefronts individual as opposed to the collective. True, except for one collective. The only collective that liberalism embraces and considers natural is the nation. And in fact, to my knowledge, gives no explanation for it. I have no problem with the, the liberal uh, focus on individual rights, but I have every problem with the liberal embrace of nation as a collective identity. Raif is right that I, I'm really not thinking of, of identity as either permanent or as natural. Uh, I am thinking of identities as historical. Uh, I'm not particularly comfortable with the word constructed uh, but, but identities as, as historical. Um, and and my, my interest is foremost uh, in, in the making of identities in the modern period, um, in the making of identities in the era of the modern state. I'm interested in the triad, history, law, and the imagination of the future. And how the nascent nation state puts these three together. I began by uh, thinking of this in a colonial context. Uh, I began with a focus on uh, census. Uh, 
senses and uh, and the making of identities. Uh, as I said, the most elaborate uh, endeavor was on the question of Sudan. Um, but then I have proceeded, as Adam I think commented, uh, to to think of the formation of the modern state in a more global sense, not simply not simply in a colonial sense. Decoupling the nation from the state. Um, I think Raif is suggesting state and nation are dyads. Decoupling is impossible. The only way forward is to change the paradigm. I'm very sympathetic to this point of view. Um, I do agree uh, that there is no, and there can be no mechanical deep coupling of the nation from the state whereby the state remains the state. I am very interested in attempts to rethink the relationship between the nation and the state simultaneously. And actually, and this is also a response to Edom, um, from, from what I've read, the most interesting uh, attempts to do this uh, have actually been uh, uh, settler states typified by the the American state, the United States of America. The Civil War made it very clear. The Civil War was, I see it as sort of at the end point of a paradigm of state construction, which the settlers brought from Europe based on the premise of national self-determination. The confederal state that the South, the notion that the South embraced and demanded was the notion of national self-determination. America was a coming together of nations and each nation must determine its own future. Every state in the American Confederation should have its own citizenship. Federal citizenship can only be a cumulative sort of a an arithmetic addition so that you first become the citizen of a state and then you become a citizen of the United States of America. On the morrow of the Civil War was born a new paradigm in a sense. And I see kind of the outlines of that paradigm in Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And that paradigm most obviously is a move from confed confederacy to federation. But more importantly, it's a move away from what the Ethiopian constitution calls ethnic federalism which is the norm on the African continent. The Nigerian constitution after the civil war. These are ethnic federalisms and they have proved problematic in every case. They have led to violence in every case. The post civil war paradigm in the US was that federalism had to be territorial. Your political status and your political rights should have nothing to do with where you came from 
and they should have everything to do with where you intend to go to. So that the federalism is a territorial federalism, not an ethnic federalism. So that you may be born in Alabama and you migrate to California and the day after you are in California, you have the same rights as somebody who was born in California. Settler states were composed of settlers who came from a variety of histories in different places. Not only the US, look at Israel too, look at South Africa too. And they had to create a settler nation, right? You're right, the state creates the nation. They had to create a settler nation, which kept on changing. Its contours kept on changing over time. And look at the American case. Anglo-Saxon, then you can get the Irish in, you can get the Poles in, you can get the Jews in. You can even get the African-Americans in. The enforced, the forced immigrants. But the only ones who cannot come in are the Indians, unless they first shed their political belonging, the political community they belong to. Um, Mishai, I'm going to, uh, I appreciate your, your elaboration and your reflection. Um, actually I do for all three. Um, but I'll engage with one point. I'm uncomfortable with the notion of national culture. Fanon, Cabral. In Cabral, the essay on return to history. Cabral has a notion that, at least I read Cabral, as proposing that one can return to source. One can move away from the colonial experience and return to the pre-colonial and continue from there. I read Cabral as nativist in some sense especially in this essay, return to source. I don't think you can return to the pre-colonial. We have a debate going on. We've had a contest for generations, at least as long as colonialism. And that debate has been a debate between nativists and modernists led by Marxists. The nativists have critiqued modernists for thinking that history begins with colonialism. Starting with colonialism, and moving forward. And the nativist critique is right. The modernists have critiqued the nativists for believing that you can actually skip the colonial period. Well, you can't because the colonial heritage is not just the external heritage. The umbilical cord which can be cut. I argue in the book that the most important political heritage is internal.
Fano has a notion of national culture. As I read Fano, it's a very top-down notion. The state makes the nation and makes national culture. Now, Chair, I don't know if you want me to go on because the next issue I would address is the one raised by Adam about the two sides of political decolonization, but make it, maybe I can reserve it as, as more questions come in. Uh, please uh, reserve it because uh, uh, I want to see if there is any intervention from uh, uh, any of the participants. I don't have any hand up yet, but I see a range of questions in the Q&A. Mahmoud, I don't know if you can read the questions in the Q&A. No, you I can't. Would rather, I would rather you tell me. I can, <laughs> but it is too distracting. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, Reda Ferguson wants to very quickly summarize your question. Reda? Can we open up for Reda? There's a question about boundaries. Meantime, I have uh, two interventions from, so I'm going to allow. Okay. Uh, I'm but who, who, who is speaking? Um, Reta, I'm unmuted now. Uh, please, can you, can you do a summary? I'll take three questions and then go back to Mamdan. Okay, so I just have a quick question and I guess the time frame is a little bit different from your time frame, but um, I was wondering if, uh, because I'm thinking of indirect rule um, and the divisions and retribalization, and I was wondering if the market maybe adopts indirect rule via the opposite means, meaning creating a form of universal, um, where it's the market is learning a similar size, but at the same time, it's actually the, the ninth right of resistance. So, um, yeah, I just don't that makes sense. Um, there, there, is a, there are two hands raised at the moment. Suresh Roberts, if we can allow Suresh to ask a question, please, uh, technical team. Hi, hello. Am I am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay, great. Um, hello. Audible, audible, but not visible. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, that, that's the best of both worlds. Hello. Um, all right, so I'm going to raise three questions quickly, and they're all framed by Adam's, um, or three points to one question. They're all framed by Adam's in, important observation about, um, in some sense, a, a, a kind of contribution to modernism that is is rooted um, much like her own excellent book in a sense, but but with real differences in, a, in an authentic, and I use that word in quotations as a provocation, an authentic account of local South African and other case studies. And uh, and our friend from, his, from Israel also made the point that we should pay attention to case studies. So in that spirit, I have three quick, quick questions, one on each case study. The first is um, the invisibility of genocide in the Native American context. You, it disappears in your account. Um, and, and that seems to me um, peculiar, to put it no more strongly. Related to that is the, the disappearance of the Jews in post-war Germany. Um, You've said this for, for several decades. I've never understood this, this point, which is that the Jews and the Germans did not need to learn to live together after um, the World War II because there was Israel. Now that seems to me a form of violence against post-war Jewish identity, um, which I've never understood. Um, apart from its implications, um, its tendency to, to excessively legitimize uh, uh, Israel, which, which could be framed as a problem. So um, Hannah Arendt in, in Zionism had a notion 
of, of national precisely without the state, right? And those, those exist. Uh, and then the third question linked to the two is, um, is the distinction you draw between CODESA and the TRC. So those seem to me equally political settlements. Um, and I, I don't understand how CODESA becomes political, but the TRC becomes apolitical. Um, it, there's a transition there, which again, for, for two decades you've made, uh, and, and I've never understood it, because it seems to me that put, the TRC is the outcome of a political process of the Constituent Assembly and the South African Constitution leading to 1996, and CODESA was merely the prelude to that, and all the actors are the same ones until you hand the TRC off to Bahrain and Tutu, which is where the abduction happens. And I've never understood the earlier distinction you make between CODESA and the TRC, so I'm hoping you can clarify that. Um, and to point that question, this is the last question, to point, to give that question a point, you, you mentioned, and I'd been waiting for some time to see the footnote on this, that in 1909, um, in installing the, the post-1909 regime, the, there was an, a delegation that went to the US to look at the Native American reserves and things like the PAR system and so on were supposed to have come out of that. Thank that doesn't come up, there's no footnote in the book and I was wondering if you could tell us what the delegations were. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Uh, can I ask uh, Norman Navi to speak? I'm allowing you to speak. So, sorry, can you repeat the name, please? Can you hear Navi. me? Uh, Roman. Uh, yes, please, I can. Uh, hello, members. Hello, Suren. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for allowing us to participate in this. And thank you to Professor Mamdani for another essential book, as well as the discussion for this, discussions for this uh, scintillating engagement with the book. Uh, I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, one is about uh, the role that the Indian Rebellion uh, has played uh, in your uh, in your works uh, uh, of late. Uh, clearly, it's an important moment for you in terms of the development uh, of colonial governmentality and colonial statecraft. Uh, but you don't. Uh, I was really, really hoping that in this book you would also have a chapter on South Asia. So. Uh, one, the reason for that illusion, I mean, after all, the problem is becoming more and more grave. The predicament uh, of South Asia is uh, really quite terrifying at this uh, point. Um, so how would you address the South Asian scene? Uh, and the second uh, question is about, uh, you know, I completely agree that the, the fact that the European nations all have these great monarchs, you know, Elizabeth, uh, Great Isabel the Great, great Frederick the Great, etc. Uh, uh, it, which is a dead giveaway that, in fact, you know, the nation is a command performance, that it is, in fact, these uh, absolutist monarchs who created these nations, which is why they're great, of course. Um, uh, is it really possible to uh, shed this legacy of absolutism, uh, given both the internal, I mean, the, the nation state system obviously inherited that and it's organized globally uh, now? So unless we have a political project, and I would suggest that, I mean, my uh, instinct is that that political project needs to be more regional and global rather than continue with uh, the state uh, in its current form. I mean, if you're not suggesting it's the current form, but nevertheless, if you're not going to, uh, if you don't have a political project that's larger, uh, how are you going to get out of this? Sorry, do I answer? Um, Godwin? Uh, sorry, uh, Mahmoud, just one more question and then we come back to you. I was going to allow Pablo to speak. Pablo? Pablo Idahosa. Okay, uh, he, he's not picking up. Mahmoud, we can come back to you. 
Thank you. Um, uh, hello. Let me, let, let me just say first, uh, uh, for a start, uh, that uh, Raif is totally right uh, about uh, the, the, the importance of looking at the, uh, the separate case studies. Uh, in fact, after I had written the book and, and when the book was in production, I really had second thoughts about the introduction. I thought the introduction was far too long and I thought the introduction really needed to do greater justice to the issues raised, raised in the case studies, rather than kind of provide a preamble, which I thought was going on and on. So in fact, in several cases, uh, I advised people, I said, skip the introduction. Start with chapter one, the chapter on, on, on the US. Um, and then come back after the conclusion to the introduction, if you still have, uh, have energy and taste. Um, so the first question with a Ferguson. Now I'm really sorry, I, there was so much interference coming in that the only thing I got was that it had something to do with indirect rule, but I didn't get the question at all. So maybe if it's possible, Rida can come in round two. I will answer the other two um, comments. Uh, Suresh Robert, I was looking forward to seeing Suresh Robert because I've uh, read him uh, especially every time he was upset by things that I had written on the TRC. Uh, so, uh, and I actually never had the opportunity uh, or, or the inclination to respond uh, to him, uh, but, uh, but I'm happy to do so right now. Um, look, I really don't think uh, that the, uh, the, the genocide of the Native Americans uh, or the uh, 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 genocide of the Jews in uh, uh, Germany is invisible here, uh, not in the least. Uh, my, my interest uh, was not just in the genocide of the Native Americans, but in the permanent solution that Lincoln crafted for the survivors of the genocide. That was, that was, that was my interest, but uh, but I actually begin with, uh, with an argument against those who say that it was disease and it was not a, 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 a state project. Uh, I begin with uh, Martin Luther King saying, we are the only nation who had a state project to eliminate the indigenous population. Uh, Hannah Arendt, I have, a, I, have a, I have an engagement with Hannah Arendt in the book uh, and I am, I am both appreciative of her, as, of her as well as critical of her uh, because Hannah Arendt uh, did not really leave the framework. She had a critique of the framework of the nation state and yet she was uh, completely trapped in it. Uh, Hannah Arendt's nightmare was that Jews would be a, a minority uh, in a future Palestinian state. Uh, and, and I think maybe kind of a Freudian slip, but several times Hannah Arendt talks as if Jews are already a majority. 1930s, 1940s, Jews are not, early 40s. Um, finally, uh, 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 Suresh Robert, I agree that the TRC was a political project, it was not an apolitical project. Uh, ju uh, just just as uh, Nuremberg was a political project. There was nothing apolitical. Uh, the politics of Nuremberg and the politics of TRC uh, was that both projects remained blind to apartheid as a political project. Both projects reduced apartheid 
to a set of apartheid or Nazism, to a set of individual crimes. Um, both projects operated through the paradigm of, 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 of violence as criminal. Um, and, and the paradigm of crime, a crime by definition uh, is against the state. The state cannot commit crime. Agents of the state can commit crime, but not the state. This was the problem. The TRC could not see what had happened under apartheid where the vast majority of the population was reduced politically, legally defined in a way that it could then be dispossessed. Um, Noman, um, well, you know, in this book, I have, uh, I have uh, rethought my, my, my understanding of the significance of 1857, uh, which, which, I, which I put forward in uh, Define and Rule, uh, because I realized when doing research for this book that actually uh, indirect rule had a, had a much longer genealogy uh, than simply its more contemporary version, which is post-1857, but even, no, not even, well, anyway, it's more contemporary version because indirect rule, I, 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 I have a couple of pages. I think it's in the introduction um, of, of this book uh, where I talk of, uh, of Roman forms of indirect rule. Um, the, the Roman Empire, its Eastern and, and its Western and Eastern wings in the Western wing, it's, it's, it's just the implantation of, of colony of soldiers. Uh, in the Eastern wing, it is ruling through existing potentates with a herald in, in, in uh, what became Palestine and Israel, um, or, or uh, uh, Cleopatra in, in, in Egypt. Um, I see the next uh, significant phase uh, as, the first phase is, is indirect rule through individual potentates, which is what the British begin with and which is what indirect rule means in the literature on India uh, when they are talking of the princely states. Second uh, uh, phase of indirect rule, in my understanding is second significant phase is the Ottoman Empire and the millet system and Ottoman rule through an existing institutional structure, mostly of religious communities. Um, and, and that is duplicated in the Mughal period, my limited understanding. Um, and that the British take on in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the 18th century. Um, now the change that comes with indirect rule uh, in, in India post-1857 is that uh, the, the, the rule, the construction of customary law, of Hindu customary law, Muslim customary law, um, and, and, the, and, the, and the imposition of customary law is not simply through a pre-existing set of institutions, but a complete rethinking of those and a recrafting of those. Um, and this, I think, is the, is the innovative side uh, of, of, of British indirect rule. Now, sure, you're right, um, and, I, and I plead guilty uh, that, that I have not written about South Asia. I cannot write about South Asia uh, without doing the necessary work. I couldn't have written about South Africa without the years that I spent there and, and the various engagements and skirmishes. That, that forced me to read through and um, I couldn't really. Uh, and, and, and I couldn't write about it without, uh, without a degree of mod modesty. Not, not just that I needed to do my homework before writing, but also that I had to be completely open to the idea that I could be wrong. And, and therefore every successive writing would be a learning process. Uh, in which uh, I, I would have to rethink 
uh, at least some of the original original positions. Um, finally, Numan, um, the 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 nation is created by absolutist monarchs. Uh, um, look, the, the, uh, should this decoupling, decoupling be a, a, a regional project? Uh, now, as, as many of the commentators have already said, I don't have fixed defined ideas on, on, on the question of, of decoupling of nation and state. Um, I, the, the only thing I do is I look on the ground for uh, 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 sort of actual movements mm -hmm. and, 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 and their, their, their legacy as kind of a raw material um, because much of what is on the ground is often quite contradictory. Um, and, and I think the role of the intellectual is not to think that you can come up with a blueprint in your study. I don't believe so. Um, but to think that one contribution you can make is to sift through the raw material on the ground and to systematize it and to present it. Now, I find two different notions of how to go beyond the nation state. Uh, one is a completely top-down notion of those who have argued for the world state. Okay, these are these are often people in in, in criminal law, and they are argue for a world state. Their their uh, their uh, their uh, 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 they idolize the ICC, and they hope the ICC is 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 the beginning of such a project, um, so that you would have a world state which was subordinate and disciplined. All these little nation states. That is one project. I'm not sympathetic with it at all. I think it would give us a nightmare. Um, I think it would give us a Karl Kautsky's super imperialism in Lenin's words. Um, the other project is, is the, the, other, the other perspective not project, is, is a bottom-up perspective. Um, and this I think has been elaborated most by the Cambridge School people um, who, who have tended to look to the pre-modern period, uh, not to resurrect it. Well, I, I'm not sympathetic with the idea of resurrecting it, but I do think that for us to look at the pre-modern or the pre-colonial period uh, uh, is, is very important because, because again, we should treat that period the same way as we would treat popular movements, social movements, movements on the ground as 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 source of raw material, to, which is so rich to think through it, not not to reproduce it, but to think through it in light of what has happened since then. So except part of the nativist claim that we need to look at an actual history but accept part of the modernist claim also that we can't go back to it. We have to engage with what colonialism created on the ground and figure out how to sublate it using Engels, Engels' term. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Mahmoud. Uh, I'll take two final interventions from uh, participants. Uh, I don't know if Pablo is still around. Pablo, are you still there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Please, uh, can you submit your question? Yes, uh, first of all, just thank you very much for the panelists. I've learned so much both uh, from the book, but also uh, the other intervention. Uh, two things, and, it, and not to be picking you and Mahmoud at all, uh, about Cabral, uh, I'll leave it there. I think there's a need to understand the context within which he was actually uh, writing. And I don't think it was reducible to uh, some pre-colonial conception of how we uh, restructure uh, any modern or new state. I think his analysis of, of people on the ground was sufficient to help us understand the disaggregated nature of culture and how one would reform that in the new context. The only other point I'd want to make is, in a sense, uh, and you've answered many of the things that I, I had to, to pose, and thank you again for an extraordinary book, is the notion of thinking 
through and about seeing like a state. And you know where that comes from, it's from Scott. And I think there are other ways of understanding those relationships. I know you're primarily concerned about, about settlement and settlement, uh, but this is a, a, another way, I think, of framing, we might say, the dyad that I think uh, Rife uh, points us to about understanding the relationship between the state and, and the nation. I just wonder if you could think about that a little bit. I know it's primarily about the, the nature of how we understand citizenship or modern citizenship and its legibility, but I think it, there's another way of framing the relationship of the state to its people that is not always, and I know it's a normative mo notion as much as it is a depicted one, but perhaps you could say a little bit about that in relation to your own work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I thought there was somebody else who had wanted to speak, but I can't see the hand raised anymore. Uh, so I'll go back to the pan. Yeah, oh, okay, it's back. Uh, Philip, Philip, I, if we can get you to speak. Philip, your mic is on, but we can't hear you. <coughs> Philip Nyalungu. Okay, uh, it's not working there. Uh, if there is any one of the panelists who wants to make an intervention before I go back to Namdani for final uh, comments, please. Mshai, Adam, or uh, Raif. Yeah, I have a question, actually. I have a question to put on the table to my mood. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Yeah, and, and the question is, is the following. Uh, if if I would ask this question uh, about the decoupling the nation from the state, what about decoupling the nation from the tribe or the nation from ethnicity? So does that open a new avenue for thinking about the whole question? So you keep the nation, but then you fill the nation with another conception. The nation as a concept remain, but the conception of what is the nation, then the nation is becomes sort of civilized, becoming civic and not naturally or organically defined. And this way you save the idea or the concept of the nation and you keep the tie to the state. W would that um, force you to reframe the idea or to elaborate more. So the idea is to decouple, not the nation from the state, but the nation from the tribe or from the ethnic group or from religion. Uh, Adam, um, I think Mahmoud, allow me to take any interventions from the panelists and then I come back to you for final comment. Just, just give me 10 seconds to turn on the light here. I think I'm in complete darkness. Okay. Um, I, and, and I think I'm just continuing on the thought um, that has just been started. And actually, for me, I read Mish this Mish book Mish as an... Mish Mish just, just one minute for Mahmoud to put on yes, his back first. Okay, he's back. I, I'm back. I'm back. Yeah. Okay, Mishai, please. I was just saying, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity just to continue to think together. This is what I read this book for. And I just wanted to um, pick up a question, I think asked by, on the question, I think it's by Wandi and Joya. And just asking about, you know, perhaps if there was a way we could, uh, uh, we could address this in relation to um, uh, Kenya or Zimbabwe. And I just wanted to say, you know, I think, what for me was really interesting about this book is as I went through the different case studies, each of which I learned an enormous lot about was to, as I said, I was using um, uh, Shuma who talks about Kukuruhundi in, in, in Zimbabwe. 
and Yvonne Wall, who unpacks the idea of the uh, post-election violence in Kenya, but from the peripheries. And I really would encourage uh, Wandi and anybody else who's interested in these um, questions to, to, to really read the book, because I think one thing that um, Mahmoud does very well is to unpack this idea of custom, to unpack this idea of culture um, through the lens of history and anthropology, and, and actually getting especially academics to think through the work that intellectuals do. Um, how the, the kind of thinking, the kind of, you know, the things that come to stand as this is the way things are. And when you start to really think through them, it makes you think about, you know, every time we think about culture as unchanging or custom, you know, we even talk about customary law as the way people have always been. I think the idea of tribe, which has just been brought onto the table, but which you've also brought up, is really unpacked in the book. The question of um, the people, as I said, that Stuart Hall says as, who are the people above else who have an inalienable right to the custodianship of the nation? And I think what um, Mamdani, um, especially when it comes to the example of South Sudan um, and Pax, is the way that you can, you can move from the question of race to the question of tribe. This idea of this is what defines the nation. These are the people who now define the nation. What uh, Shuma does in her, in her look at um, Bukuru Rahundi. And she looks at the question of now the term that Mamdan is given me is the idea of the survivor beyond victims and perpetrators, beyond um, justice, delivering justice in the criminal lens, beyond looking at who qualifies in terms of evidence. What does it actually mean to categorize people in this, whether it is initially in her book, she starts with race. And of course, the history of Zimbabwe is about white versus black, but then it comes to the question of tribe. And that is unpacked in that, in, in, in how she thinks through Gukura Hundi and who become not just victims and perpetrators, but who become survivors. Um, one thing for me that I really wanted to say that I find really powerful about that book is at the end, the protagonist who is called Zamani, um, which means history in Kiswahili for those who know the language. Zamani literally who had been pushed to sit, to live in the outhouse comes into the house. And at the end of the book, you realize the only way of saving the future represented by the young man who is lost in the book is that you've got to deal with history. Um, Yvonne O'War also centers this question of minorities. And the thing that I found useful about reading this book was this idea of tribe. I really am uncomfortable with the word tribe. And Mamdani forces us to ask, why do I use the term tribe instead of ethnicity? And how do we get to the place where tribe replaces race? In Kenya, which is an example you asked about, the big five are the only ones who determine what happens in the political community. And I think when you start to explore this question of where the minorities fit in, whether they're racial minorities or tribal minorities or religious minorities, the challenge he's giving us is that if you know you're part of a permanent minority, SDG 13 is completely an unattainable vision. And this is where we get back to that question of extreme violence. Um, both the books, dust, dust ends with this symbolic washing. You know, there's a flood, it washes away everything. And then the minorities have to work with the majority in terms of building a new future. And I think for me, that's why I found those two books compelling. But uh, one day, enjoy, I'd really encourage you to, to read um, Neither Settler No Native in that lens if you're interested in those histories. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Adam? I think we should um, give it to Professor Mamdani to close. There's already a lot on the table. Thank you very much. Uh, Mahmoud, uh, final comments, responses to some of, uh, of the questions, please. Yeah, okay. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for these, uh, for these questions. Uh, Pablo, uh, I will certainly go back to read uh, uh, Cabral with your comments in mind. Um, but when it comes to uh, the question of the people, uh, I am not as, uh, as receptive. Uh, I think nation, nation is a, I mean, I think we need to think through this relationship between the people and, and, and the nation. Uh, the nation is a category uh, embraced by both liberals and Marxists alike, right? Marx 
And Engels used to talk about historical nations and non-historical nations. And a historical nation for Marx was the nation which would have its own state. And the non-historical nation would be in the unfortunate position of not having its own state and therefore being a national minority in a state of another nation. Um, now, Rafe, uh, can we have the nation uh, as tribe, uh, religion? Uh, look, uh, my, my argument is, uh, I see the nation as the politicization of cultural identities. Mshai has talked about this and I'll just say something very brief about it, tribe and ethnicity. Tribe for me is ethnicity when it is politicized. And what do I mean by politicized? By politicized, I mean that culture is joined to territory. Culture, think of culture. Culture is not territorial. Culture goes, transcends territory. It moves across territorial boundaries, etc. Trying to kill a mosquito here. Um, so it, it's the politicization of, of, of whether the identity is ethnic or religious or whatever. That's, that's my problem. I also resist this notion of good nationalism and bad nationalism, uh, civic and ethnic, right, as you were putting it. As is, as is put in the literature on nationalism in Europe, civic nationalism, prototype of civic nationalism is France. Ethnic nationalism is Germany. For me, there are different kinds of nationalism, not good and bad. Both are problematic. The German nationalism is usually demonized because the German ethnic version of nationalism is about a segregation, right? Ethnic nationalism, segregation. Civic nationalism is not about segregation, but it is as forced as, as is segregation in the ethnic nationalism. Civic nationalism as in France is aggressively a simulationist. If German nationalism has a way of subordinating differences to the national project, it at least acknowledges differences. Civic nationalism wants to eradicate difference and demonize that which will not forcibly assimilate. You can look at France today and what's going on. Um, Mshai, I would love to, I haven't read either of the novels. So please, uh, if, if you can in an email or, or something, just, just give me the, the titles of those two. I'd love to get them and read them. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, organizers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you uh, very much, Mahmoud. Thank you, uh, the panelists, for this extremely stimulating uh, intervention. So I can't believe we've just done two hours of breaking. And uh, I know there are many, many people who had questions posted in the chat uh, that I could not uh, go to, partly because of my own ignorance about uh, Zoom, but also because of uh, the technicality of shifting from raising hands to listening to questions and all that. I really want to give my apologies uh, for this. Next time I will definitely be a lot more prepared, but definitely very interesting interventions around the epistemological question. Uh, I think Mahmoud, you are on to something in terms of shifting the discussion around the nation state in ways that are, I believe are very interesting. And I hope that uh, we can pick up and continue this discussion. Uh, I wanted to use this opportunity therefore to ask and invite the panelists or any other participant in the, in the forum 
who is interested in putting up a, a symposium in one of the pedestrian journals uh, to reach out to me or to Suren. Uh, we're interested in putting up a symposium in one of uh, the journals on this book and have a wider uh, you know, uh, circulation of it so that uh, some of the issues that remain unresolved now uh, can be written. And uh, Mahmoud, I hope you won't uh, be too busy to maybe venture a response uh, to some of the issues that might come up. I would really, really be uh, glad if we can uh, take this discussion from the virtual space into, into, the, into the spaces of a journal and see uh, how best to tap into the knowledge and ideas that uh, we can hear from you at the moment, but also that I know are sitting behind uh, the names of the participants in this, uh, in this panel. So I want to thank you very much all the way from Dakar and uh, maybe Suren to give the final remarks and then we, we will close for the day. Just want to say never too busy for Kudesri. Thank you very much. Suren? Uh, is Soren online? Yeah, he is going to sleep. <laughs> can can the technical team check because he, I wanted him to give a final word. I think so. He was frozen. Um, I'll, I'll call him now. Okay. So I hope that uh, I, I will send out an email to, to the three panelists to see if you can share with me a response uh, in written. Uh, but at the moment, uh, uh, is, is Ren back? Um, Dr. Runga, um, Suren's electricity just went off. Um, Pardon me? Uh, Suren is experiencing load shedding. Is it like ah, okay. So uh, let me take the opportunity, therefore, on behalf of the center, on behalf of uh, Codestria, to again uh, thank you very much for agreeing to participate in this. We've had a record of uh, slightly over 250 participants in this. And I hope that uh, this discussion therefore gets carried into many other places. Otherwise, I wish you very well from Dakar and hope that uh, we'll have an opportunity to engage again at some other point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.